Okay, thank you very much. I will do a very, very short and snappy introduction to the session uh, after Peter's talk, but now I'll give a very brief introduction to Peter, very, very snappy as well. Uh, so Peter, well, first we're thrilled to have Peter here. Uh, Peter did his undergraduate in uh, in Berkeley, uh, then went to uh, San Diego for a graduate studies, all in plasma physics. Flipped, undergraduate in San Diego. Okay, oh, thanks, thank you. Uh, okay, anything else I get wrong, tell me. Um, uh, and then on a chance, uh, well, attending a lecture on neuroscience, I uh, got converted to um, converted to this field, and we're very pleased that he did. So he's got work spanning quite a variety of things, sort of proving that rate codes are, are better than temporal codes in, in cortex. Um, uh, uh, a lot of stuff on probabilistic uh, population codes, probabilistic synapses. Um, but today we're going to hear about what's the question and how do we answer it. And I, I'm assuming that's not the question. Okay. <laughs> So, and that should work. Voila. Okay. Um, there's a very large field, as you guys know, up in the neuroscience, whose goal is to understand how the brain works. Um, and we've been collecting facts at an alarming pace. If you go to PubMed, I'll need to ask for neuro, 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 brain, you get graph like that. So, in 1960, it wasn't so bad. In 2022, a paper is published every three minutes. Okay, you guys all know this. It's still hard to keep up with literature. Um, what are we getting at? And it's hard to tell, and partly because nobody has really told us what to understand how the brain works. For me. Okay, it's kind of hard to know if you're making progress and you don't know what the car is. So let's talk about two things. One is define what understand how the brain works means, and the other is leverage that into well, leverage that definition into an interesting and answerable question about the brain. We know there are lots of interesting questions about the brain, lots of answerable questions about the brain, but they don't really intersect all that often. I won't say completely succeed in part two, um, but. Hopefully, I'll say some interesting things. Um, and this should really, as James pointed out, or pointed out, this should be a discussion more than a talk. Okay. Now, it's been mainly me answering questions, so you guys have to channel me. Um, so jump in anytime you disagree. I, I've been working on this off and on for like five years. I've written 10 drafts and ripped them all out. Um, and so I'm not 100% certain about many of the things I say, but it seems everything I say seems to be logical. Some of it's going to be completely obvious and some less. Okay. So let's step, you get the brain for a second. Just ask the question, what does understand mean? You guys thought about this much? I spent like about a year on this and I even emailed philosophers. Um, and in normal language, it turns out understand is really squishy. In science, it's actually, I claim, very well defined. Um, we understand a phenomenon um, that we can explain in terms of lower level processes. Okay, this is really what we do, right? You know, we have some lower level stuff and we get some behavior and we link them somehow. This is what most papers in science are about, except for the descriptive ones. It's really what's going on. It's not implied in some numbers. You always said a boss, which you don't Oh, yeah. We'll get into that. Because you can all, yeah. So it doesn't seem to include the Mars level. So I think that's a good question. Yeah. But remember, James pointed out, you're really looking at sort of a few things at a time. You can click anything you want. And you can put stuff in between. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you get to want these. Both of these phenomena and lower level process are both measurements. So let me give you an example. Um, okay, so first of all, I'll explain. This is where this is where the understanding comes. It's, it's logical or mathematical explanation. Um, and I can say a lot more about this later. Um, but this is really, it's the explaining part where you understand stuff. The phenomena and lower level process are just measurements. Okay. 
Um, this isn't really good. Okay, so voila. So in a field like physics, this is really easy, right? You take a ball, you drop it. Okay, you drop it. Um, you measure how long it takes. Okay, so maybe you drop it from different heights. Uh, okay, I'll just go over here. Um, drop it from different heights, and then you write down f equals m a equals minus m g. Do a little math, and voila. Okay. So this is important, right? So this is the you have to decide. This is a phenomenon. It could have been anything. If it was the color of the ball, it would have been a flat line. So there's stuff in the world you got to measure, but that's you, you get to pick that. You get to pick the phenomena and the lower level processes. Okay. It's a super well. It's kind of important, but I think most of the time it's sort of obvious. I claim. Oh, the the ball thing. Yeah. Well, I bet people wondered why it took. You know, I, maybe not. Okay. Maybe not as it takes a, it, it's developed, it, you know, developed slowly, but but it's not, I would claim that's not the hard part. It's usually stuff we want to, in neuroscience, it's easy, right? We want to understand behavior. But <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's non trivial, okay? Anyhow, yeah, that's a low level process. Um, that's the explanation. And this really, this is really where the understanding is. Going from this to this, I claim that's when you understand this curve, right? When you sit down, you solve an ODE. Peter, can I ask? So in, in physics, right, with black body radiation, there's a kind of there's a classic debate where you, you can fit the form, uh, you can give a functional form for this experimental data, and then the like half of the physics community was divided into, but you still need an explanatory model in terms of let's say things oscillating at different discrete states, and then half the community said no. The you know I think the approach you're presenting here, right, this is kind of Einstein and, and Bohr, right. Sorry, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know the problem, like black body radiation in physics, right? Like they, you know, they got a different curve from what was predicted by the theory. They came up with a, a great family of functional forms to describe them, and then like half the community was satisfied with that as an explanation. Yeah, but they were they shouldn't have been. Okay, okay, okay. 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 Well, that's cool. That was like good that. for predicting, but not for understanding. How did we go back? Voila, good. Okay. Um, so, so what about neuroscience? So let's change things a little bit. Let's switch to neuroscience. I'm going to switch back. But in neuroscience, um, the phenomenon is, is, is behavior, um, human animal behavior. So we'll switch lower level processes to behavior. It's what we want to, want to understand. Um, I personally interested in human behavior, but that's a preference. The lower level process, we're going to put neural circuits. Okay. So this is our definition to understand how the brain works. If we can understand behavior, if we, we understand behavior, we can explain it in terms of neural circuits. Okay. Now, you know, you can say obviously all of behavior, we get the whole brain, we can do a little piece at a time. Um, but let me let that sink in. If anybody doesn't like this, they should jump down my throat now. I just like it. Who else, who else doesn't like it? Okay, so that's a really good point. I want to come back to that. If you, if you still don't like it, and you after I introduce David Marr, then you can jump down my throat again. Okay. I agree with you. Okay. Uh, this is a straw man at the moment. Yeah. Well, it's not quite a straw man. I'm uh -huh. uh -huh. I mean, also sick of this. Uh -huh. Whether the rocks or not, I would go to the EPS for more explanation. Yes, a lot of people. Yeah. It would be helpful if we enumerate the other, other options. Other options? Yeah, what other options could one explain? I don't know of any other. Yeah. Do, you have, do you have some? Oh, I don't know. So, 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 you can say only neurons. Say again? Yeah, exactly. Only neurons or also the DNA, for example? Well, we don't know, actually. It's some lower level stuff. I mean, typically, uh, synapses are going to be involved with all that lower level stuff. Okay. We, we really want to map from, we really want to understand. So we got a bunch of circuitry in there, right? It's, a, it's mainly fat and it, and it transmits information. And then we have behavior. We somehow want to know, understand how all this stuff leads to the behavior we see. And 
mean, if you look at about half the neuroscience website, website that's what they say. I mean, like neural circuitry, everybody wants to do. And I think it's a really good goal. It's a bit hard, but I think it is what we want to do. Okay. Well, is, is it really processes, or you, you're already kind of supposed a, a metaphor on it? Like, well, it's not really. I don't think of it as a metaphor because I don't think of metaphor. This is, this is very concrete behavior stuff you measure, right? You guys are behaving right now. Neural circuitry is a bunch of spikes and. What's it called? A circuit. Well, no, I'm actually talking about the physical circuit. We've got certain properties, but we didn't. We don't define them. They're there. Which we also call the network. We call it network. Yeah, it's basically all this stuff in your all this stuff in your brain. So the alternative is some kind of physical. Non physical thing. Don't talk to your metaphysics, I know. <laughs> but if you say it's everything that is in your brain, it seems kind of obvious in a way. That it's oh, yes, there's nothing, so I don't think there's anything super deep here. Okay. So, I mean, that's part of the big guy when sharing so many of us is clearly on that bridge. Well, I have no idea. Right, well, I didn't probably have lost it. But that is. Essentially, the way it's really coming understand that we don't do it, or at least there's still some underlying manifold that we might see some projection of in your eyes, but really, this is the thing going to be. Questions like that are kind of dumb because they get settled by science. In my humble opinion. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. So, this is okay. Uh, lots of. Um, I like the questions. And I like the skepticism. Okay, I'm gonna pick it. Uh, so, you know, we saw physics, we drop a ball, everything's easy, and take a sort of a, a typical example from neuroscience or not, not atypical. So, behavior music relieves pain in humans. I did not know that, and I doubt it worked for me, but supposedly it does. Um, and here's the explanation in this paper that came up with in terms of neural circuits. Um, here's a brain, there's a thalamic nuclei. It turns out that the lower firing rate in thalamic nuclei reduces pain in mice. And we'll assume mice are the same as humans. Um, the auditory cortex, also in the brain, projects with inhibitory neurons project to the thalamus. And so you activate music, these neurons are activated and reduce pain. Okay? But, but I mean, yeah, how is relief from pain over the that's that's what we can did we get to call any behavior anything you want yeah that's behavior right you're in less pain no it's a subjective behavior it's what the subjective behavior. okay it's a phenomenon it's a it's a phenomenon we can observe we can we can we can observe okay okay this metaphysics people say they're in less pain yeah, that's the behavior. Exactly. okay reported I should say that but I'm lazy. <laughs> so, well, we can we can be super concrete. We can say if people, what we should say is, as Apple pointed out, music relieves re, um, reported pain in humans. So, the report is very concrete. They say my pain went from six to four. That's the behavior. Okay. I mean, this is this is you know. So, so the behavior was was this music relieves relieve reported pain. Neural circuits, this explanation is kind of satisfying, right? You know, sound goes to the cortex, goes to the pain center. We can do some more work. We can ask, you know, how's it computed, but this is a pretty good explanation of this behavior, okay? Um, and once we have the facts, this was all just logic, right? It's kind of weird that, you know, this, this logic is, is really separated from the things you, you measure, right? The stuff you measure and then there's this logic. Um, okay, what's my point? So this is sort of our definition of understanding. That's a measurement, that's a measurement usually. We'll get back to that because it doesn't have to be. And this is an understanding comes from some analytic link between these two measurements, okay? That's really where you understand stuff. All of a sudden, you know, given the, the you know neural circuit or some lower level process is true, it has to follow that you see this behavior. It's like the central limit theorem, right? You go a bunch of measurements, everything's Gaussian, everything's Gaussian, and voila, large numbers, independent, you get you get Gaussians, okay? It's it's a really it's a very deep understanding that's 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 kind of I don't know if anybody but humans actually have it. In fact, I'm about to say they don't. 
It also makes understanding really, really, really hard. Okay, and I'm going to say a few words about this, which should address some of the questions. If not, like me. So this comes back to Rory's point: regression does not provide understanding. Okay, let's say you know back to a little example. You fit a model. Um, you find a equals c equals d equals zero. Voila! You fit this, and you declare victory. You can predict, and maybe you can predict really, really well, but you don't understand anything other than you can do regression. Okay. Simulations don't provide understanding. So by the way, regression is useful. It's insanely useful, right? It's what we do all the time now. Simulations also very useful, same deal, right? Let's say you know F equals MA, but you can't solve ODE, so you store it on a computer, it fits really well. You can again predict, but you don't understand anything. What's the simulation? Yeah. What'd you say? What's the simulation? You just try to code, mm -hmm. run on the computer. You want to code if your it does, right? But look at in code, you're basically encoding F equals MA. Yeah, you're so the, just the, simulating. It's not like a generative model that provides the analytic link and that is simulating very well, but corresponds to the lower level processes. You're saying it's. I think it's simpler than that, right? I mean, basically, simulation just, in some sense, it's reproducing the, the behavior anyway, right? You're just writing gravity. You might as well drop the ball. Drop the ball is also a simulation. Not if you, all you know is all you know is basically F equals MA tells you what's what's happened, you know, a microsecond later given what happens. That's all you know. Why that generates a particular trajectory it does without no, you know, you, all you know is local. Okay. People yell at me for this, depending on who you are. And look at regression and simulations are this is what. This is like our main workhorse. One of our main workhorses is theorists, right? But doesn't provide understanding. Okay. So understanding is always partial. So you know this, you solve it, and you get that. You know, this is some, something that I think Rory mentioned. You don't know where people are making. So the old days, it just also came from regression, right? This was just a measure. I think now it's probably deeper theory, but in terms of general relativity, but we don't really know where general relativity comes from. And it's always going to be lower and lower and lower, probably. Okay, it's always approximate for a couple of reasons. Either because you have the approximate equations, so in this case everything looks really good. You measure point out there and you miss, right? Because you didn't take into account air resistance. Oops. Yeah. Um, or because you can't solve the equations exactly. Sorry. Just to break a couple of slides, wouldn't be arguable that it's actually the opposite to be understanding, like. You see that t equals the formula for time. Yeah. Yeah, that you can see, and you understand the process by arriving to f equals ma. But you understand which process? Oh, bro. Like you understand that at the base of what's happening, this time thing that have equal to zero. The base is that force is mass times acceleration. There is some force acting on the object, and that is actually your understanding. Not understanding that you can. Bring, uh, so I would claim that so f equals ma. That's an empirical observation. Right. Is it not the time? What? Um, is it not that time is related to time? The empirical observation? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Say it again. Is it not the time? The time is the ball. The wait, 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 yeah, the time is the ball. So, back up a second. So, the equation that people do it. That's just an empirical observation. Right, you can make that into an empirical observation as well. You can so like time and height for the things you're measuring. Yeah, right? These are empirical observations as well. Right? So the two empirical observations, one the macroscopic one, you drop the ball, and the other is a microscopic one. F equals MA. It tells you, you know, if I know what's happening at this time, I know what's happening in DT later. It's a local equation describing the world. This is a macroscopic observation. They're both just observations. I'm not sure about F equals MA being just an empirical. Not, it's not fundamental. It, it's just, we have no idea why it's true. It's just, we went and measured it, right? It could have been F equals some, you know, insanely. Physicists, get, physicists, physicists get so much credit. They're insanely lucky. How simple is the world? <laughs> it could have been F equals, you know, 80,000 derivatives. So, uh, yeah, the point because you exactly. were saying, like, you know, curvature of space time. Is that enough? Or is it just an empirical No, that's an empirical observation, right? Space and what point is it being? It never stops. You can all, well, I don't know if it ever stops, you can always go down, down, down. They're all observations. The space is, you know, 
general relativity didn't have to. The equations we see in the world didn't have to be those equations. Yes. As far as we know, the only fundamental reason for general relativity was. I mean, maybe, the, but maybe the, there was a fundamental reason. Once you know the fundamental reason, you can ask why is this? Oh yeah, look at so it's, it's, uh, look at I'm all, all I want to do is link. To, so understanding is I, I don't know if I mentioned this. It's always partial, right? It's just we have to be satisfied with linking two levels that it's all going to be approximate. It's all we want to do. We're kind of lowering our bar. We don't want to. We don't want to start with the fundamental. Laws describing the universe and work up the human behavior. It's too hard, right? We're just doing a, 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 a one level of. Okay, with that. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay. Yeah. Um. So you know, so we could write, we could solve, solve. We can drop a ball. We can solve that double pendulum. You can't, as far as I know. I think it's provably. You know, once things are chaotic, no analytic solutions exist. Okay. So we can't. So it's it's you know it's always a proxy, it's always partial. In fact, in physics, you know, until chaos theory came along, everybody thought, oh, we'll just solve the equations. Turns out you can't. So they just changed the question. Okay, um, which is kind of important. Some things can't be understood. This is phenomenon. This Lorentz equation. Um, and so, as far as anybody knows, you can't go from here to here analytically. So you, like you say, you change the question. Um, you have to be very, very careful what you ask. Some things aren't understandable. There's also the halting theorem, which um, halting theorem, halting problem, which I know nothing about, but also comes to anyhow. Um, you get the idea. So we place a super high bar on understanding, right? And this explains things. It's a mathematical link. Is anybody still like? Totally anti this, or this. I just I browbeat them into submission. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm not totally anti this. Oh yeah. Uh, is is mathematical? Is a math model of a process expressed in math in the only form of You know, I'm gonna say yes, but it could be logic. But it's something you scribble on a piece of paper. It's got to be logic. It's got to be some kind of logic. I think. I mean, I'm not. 100% sure about that. I just can't think of anything else, which is really not a very good good motivation, but it's where I am now. Yes. Anything you major is behavior. It's, you know, we, we turn, it, turn it to behavior for neuroscience, but it's just some phenomenon you want to it could be behavior fungi, it could be trees, it could be water, it could be, you know, water diamonds are. Yeah, it could be, you know, water diamonds are. That's a phenomenon. Water diamonds are the most. It's anything you want. Pretty much, yeah. Well, so, so, yeah, yeah, so if if we can decide a mathematical link between two levels, we say we understand the upper levels. If, if A is true, then B is true. We understand. Explanation at all. Think about philosophy too much. I mean, I think this is. I mean, 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 Oh, or should we define understanding? Oh, this is my definition. I don't should or not should. This is my definition. In some sense, this is kind of personal. So basically, but I think this is not. This is really what goes on, right? When things get demystified, because you can say, you can say, okay, this this is true. This has to go on. It's no longer mystery. Given this is true. Interesting, you would say that. 
It, so, it, 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 <laughs> this is yeah, yeah, scientific I, understanding, right? Yeah, this is scientific understanding, right? Yeah. And honestly, I think that if you think about most of what we think we understand, it's really, we just see it over and over again if we use it. Most of what we do is regression. So, do you have a definition for a link? No. <laughs> okay, so let's take like, like the old sign of the gate part, which is the sign of the gate you don't get an equation saying that receptive fields are a certain function or something. Yeah. You actually don't get a function. Yeah. And you need to get data and then you optimize something. Is this a mathematical unit? So that's a very good question. Uh, no, this is the answer. I'll make a very strong answer. Um, basically, they said. So they basically said, you know, here's what we're optimizing. It's a lot. Okay. They did some simulation, and the loss produced some behavior. So I mean, maybe the, maybe the understanding is okay. A loss, if you do simulation, produces behavior. It's kind of an observation. You sit down and turn the crank and say, oh, given this loss, I had to have these those little two more like seven fields, which I believe people have done. Then you understand. So just doing simulation, I'm saying no. It's a pretty strong statement, which I'm not 100% sure of. What there is no A lot of stuff emerges. When it just emerges, we don't have So I think that it means that you have a set of right? Well, uh, it's complicated because you know, usually you don't. You, somebody who does perturbation theory, you do mathematical proxy, you say, well, if these assumptions are true, then you derive this, maybe we get some universality conditions. It's not rare, it's rarely going to be, you know, h equals, you know, t equals square root of 2, to h equals 3, right? Okay, well, and I identify that as the most interesting. Between what and what? Between what and what? But you have to draw the line. It's just, if you just do simulations, it doesn't count. Well, it's just basically like this. Sometimes you have a full-blown mathematical theory. Okay, so we can probably argue about this together, but I'm going to stick this. I'm going to say all sets and fields, no. And maybe I'll revise that later. And there was some understanding, right? The idea that a loss could give you something. Um, well, I think people usually say that this is actually an excuse for the understanding. Now we understand. In fact, now we understand the scientific community why the scientific views are and they are. I claim the scientific community was kidding themselves. Okay. Yeah. So maybe we can make this more nuanced, right? What you can understand versus what you know is kind of goes up like this. Um, these are This is off limits. This is a point. Some stuff, given what we understand, is off limits. And let's say this point here is sort of what, the, you know, this is the best one can do. I'm going to put zeros down here to possibly irritate people a lot, and probably the brain's up there. Um, I suspect we're going to need more math before we have any kind of deeper understanding. Okay. Now, sometimes the math is simple, right, in this case. Uh, sometimes, but usually the math is really, really complicated. Um, you know, things like object error connection, language, abstract reasoning, generalization, you name it, those things aren't going to be, you know, this circuit gets activated, this circuit gets activated. It's going to be something more complicated. Um, okay, that was warm up. How am I doing on time? Oh, perfect. Um, let's go back to the brain. So this is our, our definition, which Appa doesn't like, which is maybe reasonable. Um, so, and I said the explanation has to be mathematical. We need equations. Um, we kind of have them on short time scales, right? This is details are important. That's memory potential, conducting space models. Um, and this is not a bad this equation describing neurons in short time scales without learning. Um, except we don't know the weights, right? In humans, we're missing 100 trillion parameters. Trillion in the mouse and even 10 million in the lowly fruit joint, okay? So this is the problem. We don't really know the equation describing the brain. Take into account learning, right? Write down learning rules. That's better. We don't know the initial weights. We're going to get that in several decades. 
Um, we don't know the learning rule. We're also going to get that, actually. But right now, we don't know the learning. Yeah. Um, there's lots of in vitro experiments, but they don't really tell us how the error um, is involved. And this is actually a critical thing that we're missing as theorists. Um, so no matter how you look at it, we don't know the equation of spreading the brain, okay? It's gonna make it a bit hard to link equations to behavior. Um, it's fact impossible, right? So given this, it seems impossible to understand how the brain works given what we know currently. Okay, thank you for your time. <laughs> um, there's a workaround, David Moore, okay? So David Moore said, you know, don't make your life so hard. It's three levels of analysis. Most of you know this computational algorithm is computational. The computational is basically pick a behavior. It's my interpretation. Find an algorithm that produces the behavior and find neural equations that implement the algorithm, right? And, and really more focused on the algorithm. For him, that's where the understanding came from. If you understand the algorithm, and you can implement in, in neural circuitry, which is usually something we can do. We know a lot about the networks and neurons right, right now. We can do most stuff. Then you're kind of done. Okay. So how many of you guys, most, have you heard of David, know about David Moore? Probably most of you, yeah, good. Anyhow. So I'll give you an example of decision-making. I'll go through this quickly because most of you have heard of this. A uh, bunch of random dots moving in, in directions. Um, famous random dot kinematogram. Um, and you have to ask the dots moving to the right to the left. The coherence, the fraction of dots moving to one side, um, tells you how hard it is. High coherence, it's easy. Low coherence, it's hard. There's some reward structure. Um, classic speed actually trade off. Right? If you take more time, you're more likely to get right, get it right, but you'll lose, you know, potential money. You don't want to wait forever because it's a waste of time. Here's a behavior you want to explain. This is these are three different monkeys, and they have classic psychometric curves. You know, coherence is high, they're almost 100% correct, and the hard trials are taken. Okay, totally, totally, totally standard. Um, a near optimal algorithm is integration of evidence. So evidence defined as the instantaneous sort of average average speed, say, average velocity. Um, you just plot that, you hit a bound, you, you choose left, you choose right. Um, algorithm explains the data really, really well, not perfectly, but really well. And we understand it deeply, right? We can write down equations, solve them exactly in some regimes and approximately others. We just, this is just completely demystified. Um, okay. Problem is it doesn't scale. It doesn't scale to hard problems. Um, like my usual set of hard problems. We don't know the algorithms, right? So, so no idea what the algorithm could I, um, you know, so I think like the classic Marian distress with the algorithmic level is identifiability, right? So we, we know we have an algorithm there. Yeah, so, that, so in the case of something like decision making, yeah. in the case of something like object recognition, it's finding the algorithm. You will, okay, yeah, cool. So in the case we can find the algorithm to identifiability problem, um, in the case of other stuff, it's the algorithm that's yeah. the problem. Yeah. Okay. Um, almost for sure we want the foreseeable future, right? Um, and you can ask a simple task tells anything about that, how the brain works. The field seems to think, yes, I'm a bit skeptical, honestly. It's a bit like um, training a deep network and then showing some images and, and say, okay, that's going to tell me how the deep network works. It's probably not. Anyhow, another conversation. Um, so so the, the problem with the MAR approach is, is for the hard problems, we don't know the answer. Okay, so it seems off the table, but can we fix it? So he had a really good idea, right? Going from neural circuits to behavior at one go is really, really hard. We don't know the equations, even if we did, they're complicated nonlinear. Um, adding an intermediate step is a really, really good idea, right? Okay, where are we? Um, anyhow, it could be a learning algorithm. This is basically what you. Um, what you, I think what you're getting at, old school MAR is behavior, find an algorithm that we understand and implement in neural circuits. Okay, that's old school MAR. New school MAR is pick a behavior, find a learning algorithm, which of course includes the architecture, um, the producer the behavior, and then it's actually implementation is pretty easy, right? And now you get to compare the circuitry to the circuitry in the brain. 
the circuitry max, max matches you declare victory. I think this is a pretty good approach. Okay, but it has a couple serious problems. Uh, first of all, it's super classic, right? This is, I think many people think, this is weird, anyhow. Um, so it goes back to the Carla. It actually goes back to like 1990. I don't know if you guys, you guys should actually read that paper. It's super cool. Um, David Zipscher did exactly what they're doing today. I think it was in the motor system, but he says sort of the same things. Um, so it's an old approach. There are problems. Um, skipping everybody's slides. So I don't know if you guys seen recently the Dylan regression study about, about the brain um, or about shaping high level, whatever. And the main point is they ran like 50 different networks. These are convolutional and these are transformers and they all explain the brain but they all match neural activities and brain score on this axis about the same. They weren't very distinguishing, which is kind of a bummer, right? We really like to get let much more information out of this. I don't think it's impossible. It's a lot harder than people say, um, right? The 50 different models with very different architectures, transformers versus CNNs, um, give the same, you know, match as well. What can you conclude? But I think this is the other thing, and this is actually why I sort of switch to think about deep learning. Um, if we could pin down a model, we wouldn't understand it, either, right? Because we don't understand deep networks. I think they're potentially more understandable, but um, it's a bit of a problem. It's not a limit. I completely agree with what you said. I just don't understand the following. Uh, yes, you, we don't, you say we don't understand uh, deep networks. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, these networks, um, according to your definition, aside of uh, mathematical links, as I said, they are mathematical links, or are they? No, no, they're not. They're okay. they're they're just a simulation. Oh, but you could express the network as a mathematical. Part oh, you can no. So you can write down the equation describing yeah. networks, and you can solve them on it. You can simulate. You can run them on a computer, mm -hmm. but you can't look at those equations and say, "Oh, I know what's going to happen." So then I don't understand your definition of mathematical link. Going back so the mathematical link is, is basically scribbling a bunch of stuff on a, on, a, on a piece of paper and going from, you know, here's our equation, here's, here's our deep network. So I know all the equations. I know the training data. And without running any simulations, you predict the final input output function. Or you predict a generalization there. You predict something about it. Right. So you can basically have another analytical link or something where you just look at the equations from paper and you don't need a computer. Don't need a computer. And also, that's what we've been doing for a lot of hundred years. It is. And we haven't, right? It's, like, it's just very unlikely that it's like behavior can be explained by this thing. I agree. I totally agree. <laughs> well, I'm very unlikely, very hard. I don't, I think, so again, we have to decide what question we can answer. And some of them we won't get. Yeah. So is that any single question you do is that we actually understand or anything else that we understand according to your definition? Um ask me later, let me think about that. I would probably say I'd say probably not, but then maybe I'm wrong. I think there are some things we kinda understand, but maybe some reinforcement learning type things. I don't know. What about Good the question. perceptual decision making, like the gentrification models you were showing? Your issue is just that the question is too simple? Well, so we have a pretty good idea about how perceptual decision making could work. Same with, same with regular decision making. Uh, so, in some sense, now it's, it's sort of models. Which, one, which of your models is correct? And, and so, I think we understand how it could work. Uh, not, I'm not sure we understand how really essentially this make may be pretty close to reasonable. Okay. Yeah. Um, so these are only a question, okay? So we seem to paint ourselves into a serious corner. Um, right? We started with this and explain, you know, it's complicated because it requires some kind of analytic link. We're not allowed to use regression. Not only these simulations, we have to use our brains. Our brains were really not very smart. Not nearly as smart as we need to be. 
Um, so I never, that's why I never suffered from imposter syndrome. It wasn't like I always thought I was smart. I figured nobody's smart. Next easy. Okay. We don't know the equations. Uh, we don't know how to make them up. Old school Mark didn't, old school Mark didn't work. We don't know the algorithm. New school Mark is more, doesn't really work because we don't, um, we can make up the learning rules, but we don't know what to do with them. Um, so what should we do? Okay. Do we give up? Um, besides which fields. So I'm going to start with what we shouldn't do, and that should lead to what we should do. What we should do is sort of the weakest part of this talk, because I don't really know. There are some things that I would like us to do, but no idea if they're a good idea. Okay. Need to back up a little. Okay, so let's ask if we can understand a vanilla feedforward heap network after it's been trained. And the reason I focus on after it's been, been trained is that's where most of systems neuroscience, the kind of experiments that poke electrodes in brains work. Okay? So here's a um, so here's the deal. I tell you everything about the deep network. The learning rules, the images you trained on, the weights versus time, that you record from neurons. How does it work? Does anybody know what this means, this question? It's kind of hard to even decide what it means, but and I can tell you I can tell you actually why I think it's so hard to answer. Um, so the network produces a complicated decision boundary in image space. Okay, we all know this. If this is cats and dogs, this is our network eventually gives you something like this. So those are cats and those are dogs. Okay. Um, and the boundary is a function of the data, not the network. Right? The network is just implementing it. And we can see this. It's a super cool paper. Um, if you take two networks, ResNet 50 and Alex, and actually use these networks, right? You train them, you know, ResNet 50 says cat, AlexNet says cat, right? ResNet 50 says whatever that is, cat. What's AlexNet say? Cat. ResNet 50 takes that image and says dog. What's AlexNet say? No idea. Dog. Okay. So this is Daphne Weinshaw. The reviewers hated this. I love this paper, right? They've looked at lots of different networks, not all. It's now 2019. Uh, the data is learned in the same order, and um, it classified the same examples in the same way. Okay, so if one network makes a mistake, the other network makes the same mistake, and it's just basically it's not so surprising. They're just learning the same decision boundaries. That's one. That's two. Right? If they learn the decision boundaries perfectly. Um, they would be identical, even though they're completely different architectures. Okay, and so to understand deep networks. We have to understand the data they operate. We take it, what do deep networks do? They take data and they compress it into weights. Sometimes compression is helpful, it throws away this fluff. In this case, it apparently is not. It's an insanely nonlinear transformation. It's one to many, and it has not been helpful. Um, and so let's be clear what understand the data means. So it means understand some transformation of Y from F, X to Y. Okay, we're about it. We're good. And basically, it means write a program that implements y equals f of x, which was um, write a program that labels images. This was a 1967 project at MIT. I gotta get Marcel. You gotta send me the, the original project. Um, and so this is really hard, right? Sometimes we understand the data, right? Modular arithmetic. This is a super cool paper that came out not long ago. If you train a network on modular arithmetic. It actually, you can see in a network that's implementing a program that you could have written. It's not the first one you would have written because it involves Fourier transforms. You would have written, you know, an integer arithmetic, but it does implement the problem. You can actually look at a network and understand it completely because you know the algorithm. You understand the data. You understand the transformation. Um, it's a lot harder if you don't, right? Um, for hard problems, we don't understand the data. It's probably because the data is complex and it's messy, right? Natural statistics are not described by second order statistics. Right? It's just, it's ugly and messy in their special cases. It's a nightmare, right? It's why classical AI failed. It's why we use deep networks in the, in the first place. We've basically given up trying to understand the world. Okay? And it's not exactly given up, but these big tech companies have given up. There's some subfield of work, some subset of scientists who are still trying to understand the world. Um, but it's a really, really, really hard problem. And if you ever did understand the world, we'd probably understand the, the networks that produced it. Okay. Um, 
So questions like this, you know, how does a deep network train on images work? May be answerable someday, but it's pretty hard. Insanely hard. So here's an easier question we can ask. We can ask about how do deep networks learn, okay? Which is really where most of deep learning theory is focused. It's not on, you know, some people say, okay, they look at, they sort of do neuroscience experiments, but most of it is, you know, what's generalization error? Why does this architecture work and not that? What are the inductive biases? Phrase I hate, but um, I now use it. But we can also ask about the brain. You can ask how the brain looks. Um, so should we be focusing, should we be focusing on the question, how does the brain work? And the answer is yes and no. Here's the problem. The questions about learning the brain is a really, really bad model system, okay? Most learning is on evolutionary timescales. Except for humans, most animals learn almost nothing. Even big mammals, right? They learn who their friends are, who, you know, where to forage for food, but they don't really learn very much. Their sensory system works, their motor system works, um, genetically programmed. It's, they don't learn that much. It's hard to study neural circuits during learning. So behavior is fine, but if you want to stick electrodes in, animals don't learn for all that long, right? So, you know, you can't repeat things. People have been avoiding this, not because they didn't want to know about learning, but it was so hard to do experimentally. Um, and we don't know learning. Okay, so I'm telling you, I'm not telling you anything new. I'm telling you that neuroscience is hard. Um, and I just sort of made it harder, right? Kind of bad news for systems neuroscience, but most of it focuses on, on circuits after they've learned. And that's, I don't think is a good question. Okay, so um, I hope I did that. So how many are happy with my definition? <laughs> Whoa, how many hate my definition? <laughs> how many are, have to think about it some more? How many of you think you'll eventually come see the light and agree with me? <laughs> Anyhow, I think it's, look at, even if you don't like my definition, this is something that's really worth thinking about, right? We need an interesting target. Um, okay, so, so let's talk about this one, right? Um, can we define, the, um, come up with interesting questions? Um, so you can ask, this, and it can, is there anything we can get out of studying the brain? Okay, and I propose two things. They're kind of, these actually, I don't know, these are pretty obvious at the end. We could have skipped the whole thing. These are kind of obvious questions, but I think they're, they're now becoming much, much more important than maybe they were before. We need the learning rules, okay? And we're gonna get them. This is an experimental question. Um, so we have this, we really need, need to know this. How do you map from activity, including some kind of error signal to the weights? Um, we could make progress, right? It's mainly an experimental question, but I guarantee you, if you gave me those equations, I could do something with them. Um, and the other thing, which is a little more squishy, and I'm not really sure if it even makes sense, is a global architecture. Okay, so the, the way I think of the brain is full of a bunch of stupid deep networks, arranged in a particularly uh, sensible way, okay? So we more or less, brains more or less divided up into areas, more so for primates and mice. But if you could say, okay, that's effectively a feed forward network, that's a transformer, that's a graph neural network. If we could identify sort of regions of the brain as doing something, that would be insanely useful. We've developed a huge amount of intuition about deep networks, right? We know what feed forward networks can do, right? We know what recurrent networks can do. I mean, they're all recurrent in the brain, but how effectively recurrent. We know what transformers can do. We know what all this stuff does. We know some of it operates on different time scales, okay? And then, of course, um, we can ignore the brain and study deep networks where your prep never dies. Um, one of the bad things about studying the brain, at least with electrodes, is you can't get very much data. Um, it's hard, we don't really have the tools, um, kind of a new direction for theorists, but um, I think those are really the two things we actually care about now. So, so when you say we know what they do, like, how, how does that relate to the previous definition? You know what that is? It, well, a transformer. Oh. How does that relate to the previous definition of understanding? Uh, so, I would say we have some intuition about what's going uh -huh. We're missing a really deep understanding. Um, but I think we're going to get it. 
And it's going to be about learning, not about how they work. Uh, progress has been insanely slow. But for instance, we now understand, I would say we understand pretty well, two layer uh, nonlinear networks with Gaussian input. Mm -hmm. And even mixtures of Gaussians. So we're getting there. But it's, it's, this is a hard problem. And we're making some slow, sort of slow, I think, steady progress. That's pretty much it. Um, so our starting point with this, which only a few enlightened souls thought was a good idea. Um, and the classic approach of Skumar, you know, we place equations with, uh, with algorithm was a good idea, but um, it's great for simple behaviors, but it doesn't work for the kind of complex human level behavior that I personally am interested in. My classical AI fa failed. Um, we're stuck writing down the actual equations describing neurons and synapses, maybe glial cells, hopefully not, but probably. Um, we don't have the equations, we're missing trillions of parameters in humans. Bit of a lag. Um, meaning there are no equations to link, no help with understanding the brain. Bit pessimistic. Um, so at this point, you know, theorists, in some sense, don't have much to work with. We can make up equations, we can make up algorithms, but we're really, really missing some stuff, right? We need learning roles, and we need some kind of a sense of the global architecture. Maybe a global architecture doesn't make sense. But I'd be pretty happy with the learning roles. I'm not going to get them before I'm dead, probably. But um, you guys might. OK. Almost everything else is looking with a light. Um, so I want to know Thomas Schlogel, um, San Frank Welcome Center, and Will Durrell, who's a very talented guest speaker. Grad student, don't blame them for anything I say. And also, um, very generous funding from uh, Gatsby and Morgan. OK, thanks. So we're pretty out of time, right? But we, we, have, um, we have five minutes, if anyone has any extra questions. So I really like the idea of the global architecture. One thing you like. Yeah, all of you work together, but the teams did not square with the whole rest of the, right? You don't think that that's what that actually you understand. Well, so it doesn't, but, but now you can say, okay, if you can really identify the global architecture, you can say, this is the feed forward network. Now I can study feed forward networks. Understand them, and then, okay, so they probably won't be perfect net, but then you can, you can leverage stuff. Understanding is hard and it's slow and it's incomplete. Mm -hmm. So we'll take anything you can do. I, was, I don't disagree with the depth, but I think it is, I kind of see it more like we can do all these different things in neuroscience, right? Oh. Uh, it's kind of, we should try simple stuff, simple equation stuff, we should also try deep learning stuff, yeah, 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 and yeah, vary yeah. all the things to see if we can get past this point with all of them. In, in my terrible moments, I agree with you. In my less terrible moments, I think we should stop all experiments. We should continue to pay experimentalists. We need, maybe we should do experiments every, every you know, couple of months to keep them in practice. And the theorist salary should be slowly, slowly lowered until we came up with something decent, right? I blame the field lack of progress on theorists. Experimentalists can do anything they want, and they don't know what to do because we have no guidance. Yeah, and then what, you know, like uh, we, we like struck out animals earlier, but I guess the way I would, the kind of logical conclusion of that argument, I think would be just a smart start with the smallest system possible to try and infer the F and that. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I go back and forth. I, so I'm interested in human level behavior, but my experience in science is if you understand anything deeply, you learn a lot. Mm -hmm. And so maybe if you work in what level of lots. Yeah. It's not it's totally I'm I'm not saying we totally work on humans. But yeah, yeah. I totally agree with that. So it seems like this global architecture approach of identify uh, I guess equivalences between certain parts of the brain and certain neural network architectures and then you can study the neural networks. It seems like this correspondence people have been trying to establish between convolutional architectures or transformers in the visual system falls in that domain. Do you think then that the issue, do, is there still work to do establishing the correspondence between deep networks in the visual system, or is it more theorists now need to understand? No, I think, I mean, show that work. slide, everything explains the visual system. Great. Right. Right. Yeah. So I think, I, I think it's a good approach. I don't do it myself. Um, I think it's going to yield something, to, and, and I, I think it hasn't yet. 
hasn't yet nailed things down um, for lots of reasons, but I, I do think it's a good question. One, one last question. Uh, what about it? Okay. So um, the reason that I'm not fully convinced uh, is that um, I think that even though it seems like a very, very general suggestion, but to make it uh, nonetheless, I think it's uh, quite constrained in the sense that uh, I mean, I, 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 I really like the approach of uh, Busaki, the inside out, uh, the brain inside out. Oh, <laughs> okay, well, there, there you see where I'm coming from. So, what I'm saying is that you, you're proposing this global architecture, but uh, in the same way or similar way that you mentioned that, uh, you know, the networks, are, the weights are uh, depend on the, or represent the data. And it's also um, constantly doing that depending on the environment. And you seem to follow strictly into the uh, computer uh, brain computer metaphor where your, your system is all in the brain and it's not necessarily. Uh, well, yeah. that's driven by outside world. Yes, but it's driven in a way that it makes this um, really uh, still very hard, I, I would argue. Oh, yeah, okay, I don't quite understand the point. I'm going to talk about it later. Okay, sure. Okay, okay. Well, yes. thank you. Sir.